Hi, Jan. I, I'm not hearing you at all. Let me see here. Let me see. Good morning. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that works. Good morning. Morning, Jan. It's fine. Good. Good morning. Good morning. Morning to you. Uh, a few minutes for everybody to get on and then we'll go ahead and get started at, at um, eight o'clock or nine o'clock depending on where you are. Good morning. This is Fred Hall checking in. Hi, Fred. Hi, Montserrat. Excuse me? No, I was, um, Montserrat is also on and uh, I don't okay. know if she's hearing us or not. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias, everyone. Good morning. Hi, Victor. This is Jim. Oh, how are you? I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm doing okay.
Jan, was that your bride that just passed by behind you? <laughs> it was. Tell her hello. <laughs> Can you hear us, Montserrat? Hi, Ruben. Good morning, Jan. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Reagan. Good morning. That was Fred Hall who just greeted you. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Hi, Steve. Hi, Jen. Oh, myself. So, hi, good morning, everybody. It's, it's uh, the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Steve Janetta. I'm a director of the Cambio Center at the University of Missouri, and I'm also faculty in the Division of Applied Social Sciences. Um, I'm the uh, director of the project, and I'm working with uh, two others in one in Michigan, uh, Ruben Martinez, and then Jan Flora, who's uh, uh, directing our work in, in Iowa. So this morning, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things we've learned over the last few years uh, while we've been working on this project. I know and some of you have been involved with us at different points along the way, and we kind of wanted to to share with you what, um, what we're learning and, and get some input from you as well. Um, what I'd like to do, it's, it's not a huge group. We have oh, 25 participants. If we could take just a second to, to have everybody uh, introduce themselves uh, and, and, say, and say a little bit about where they're from. Um, I'll just, I have a list here. I'll just go down the list so we can go through this rather quickly. Um, Corinne, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, um, I'm Corinne, Corinne Valdivia. I'm also in the Division of Applied Social Sciences. I lead the research side of the project for MU. And, um, and I'm really glad to be here with you all. Hmm. Uh, Ruben, do you want to introduce yourself? Let's go down to Jan. Maybe Ruben stepped aside for a minute. Well, I'm, I'm Jan Flora. I'm in Iowa. And I'm uh, the leader on the Iowa portion of the project. Okay. Sorry, I'll jump in now. I uh, muted myself. <laughs> uh, I'm Ruben Martinez. I'm the co PI for the project for the Michigan component. I'm uh, also a sociologist here at Michigan State University and the director of the Julian Zamora Research Institute, which is a Latino-focused research institute here at MSU. Welcome. Sure, man. Um, I, the next on my list is Reagan. Hi, I'm Reagan Blue, dairy specialist down in Southwest Missouri. Uh, welcome, Reagan. Oh, gosh, this keeps bouncing around. Um, I have Filiberto. Hi, my name is Filiberto Villa. I'm working with the Michigan Food Department Systems and uh, Ruben Martinez, too, uh, with Latino farmers in Southwest Michigan. Great. And I have Mark Longstraw. Hi, I'm Mark Longstraw. I'm a fruit educator for MSU Extension in Southwest Michigan, work in uh, blueberries, and have worked quite a bit with Hispanic growers down here. Right, terrific. And then I have Mary Palema. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Palema. I'm in Sioux Center, Iowa. I teach at Dort University and I serve on the Center for Advocacy, Service and Assistant Board here in Sioux Center. Welcome. And then Rubido, is that, is that right? I'm sorry, what did you say, uh, Stephen? I said, uh, on the next on my list was Robido. And I might be messing that up. Um, Monica, Monica Robido. 
Nah. Oh, maybe they stepped away. There's John Wall set. Okay, and then I have uh, Stephen, Stephen Lair next on my list. Uh, let's see. Chris, Chris Peterson. Couldn't find my mute button there for a second. Uh, Chris Peterson, uh, emeritus uh, professor, food, agriculture, and resource economics at MSU. Uh, and I uh, founded and ran for many years uh, uh, the MSU Product Center, Food Ag Bio. Uh, which is an entrepreneurial assistance organization. Thank you. And the next I have is Florencia. Hi, so I am Florencia Colella. I am with Michigan State University Extension. I cover West Central Michigan and I am a farm business management educator. I am just joining for the upcoming year, hopefully. Okay. I have uh, Fred Hall. Good morning. I'm Fred Hall. I uh, had the opportunity to work with Jan Floor in a project uh, here in Northwest Iowa. Uh, I'm the dairy specialist for 23 counties uh, in Northwest Iowa. I bet you get a lot of miles on your car on that with my big a territory. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I have uh, Jen Silvetti. Is um, this is Jen Silvery. I'm the director of Michigan Food and Farming Systems. I'll turn my camera on for you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, Michigan Food and Farming System, Systems is a statewide nonprofit that connects beginning and underserved farmers to resources. So we work through several farmer networks and function as the conduit to you folks and our friends over at USDA. Great. Uh, Jennifer Lutz. Hey, I'm Jennifer Lutz with the uh, University of Missouri Extension. I work in the far southwest three corners, uh, or three counties in the southwest corner of Missouri. And I'm an ag business specialist with uh, uh, economics degree. So that's kind of where I do. Thank you. Um, let's see, Jessica Claypool. Good morning, this is Jessica Claypool. I'm with um, Missouri Farm Service Agency and I um, handle public affairs and outreach um, in our state office in Columbia. So thanks for having me. Thank you. John Wolseth. Hi, I'm John Wolseth. I work for Iowa State University Extension. I'm a field specialist uh, working with uh, Latino and immigrant communities here in Iowa as well as housing issues. My, my background is uh, I have a PhD in cultural anthropology and linguistics. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Gottney, is that right? Yes. I um, work in the Berry County, southwest corner of um, Missouri, the USDA office farm service agency. So I administer farm programs to producers. Excellent. Then uh, Marcelo. Good morning. Uh, this is Marcelo Siles. I work for GSRI and developing some programs for Latino farmers in Michigan. Let's see. Um, uh, Maria Rodriguez Sacala. I'm Maria Rodriguez Alcala and I work for University of Missouri Extension in the Southwest region. Um, let's see, Montserrat. Mm. And she's got like she must have had problems in like getting on. 
Let's see, Susan Jasker. Susan's uh, mic is muted. Hi, um, this is Susan Jaster from uh, West Central Missouri. I work for Lincoln University and I'm standing in for Jim Pierce. Okay. He has uh, uh, resigned from Lincoln University, so he sent me this link so I could listen in. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's see, I have Russ Neal. Have I had you on yet? Yes, Russ, Russ Neal. I'm with the uh, Farm Service Agency, Farm Alone in the uh, southwest corner of Barry County, Missouri. Oh. And I have Cami Spicer. And Cami, you're muted. Your mic is muted too. She may have there you go. I'm I'm here. I'm Cami Spicer and I'm the C E D in Barry and Lawrence County in Southwest Missouri. Welcome. Thank you. And I have uh Victor Oyervitas. Hello, um, I'm Victor Oyervitas with uh Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Um I'm a field specialist uh with community and economic development and farm food and enterprise development. Uh, I work in Central Iowa and uh, East Iowa with uh, Latino communities and uh, Latino entrepreneurs. Welcome, Eliazar. Would you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Good morning. This is Eliazar Gonzalez. I work at Lincoln University Cooperative Extension. I'm working with the position there. I start formally November 2019. And I am in the program agricultural economics and small sustainable farms. We'll be working with producers with limited resources, uh, including Latinos, African Americans, and other minorities, also women, and any kind of farmer who is struggling with resources to everybody does, but we are focusing very much on underrepresented and people who with limited resources to produce. Thanks, Eliezer. Um, and then I have Celise Christie. Morning. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Celise Christie. I work at Practical Farmers of Iowa in Ames, Iowa, um, and I've been working with Montserrat and others at the office to, and others also on the call, um, to see how we can expand our programming um, to include um, specific programming for Latinx farmers with, uh, across Iowa. Wonderful, thank you. So have I missed anybody? If I have, please take a second to introduce yourself. Hi, this is Montserrat. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me, and now I've been able to listen to you. Hi, welcome. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, just Montserrat Inigas, uh, Latino Outreach Contractor with Practical Founders of Iowa. Um, anybody else? Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and um, get started here. Let me put the... the presentation up here. Um, so the um, this is a project that began about a little over right around four years ago. Um, we, we received um, funding from um, uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture um, uh, to uh, small and medium farms grant program to to look at what's going on with uh, uh, the Latino farmers in terms of thinking about um, uh, th we've been exploring their entrepreneurship. What are, looking at things like their what is the relationship like with resource providers? How are they? Um, um, Entering farming, uh, what does uh, look like in terms of how their farms are growing and developing? 
Are they connecting to other um, uh, other farmers? Uh, what is what is kind of what are their what is their pattern in terms of thinking through and developing their um, entrepreneurship as as farmers? Part of the reason we were funded, I think, is because there's just a, been a rapidly growing um, uh, number of, of Hispanic farmers um, uh, across the country, but uh, we noticed particularly in the Midwest. Uh, the Latino population has really been on the rise um, since the 1970s. You can see on the graphic here how, how much it's grown um, in, in that time period. For us in Michigan, it really took, or Missouri, it really took off beginning uh, the mid 1990s when we started seeing more uh, agro-processing uh, located here in Missouri. Uh, but other drivers have also been things like construction and trades, um, light manufacturing, um, Corinne and I have done uh, some work around that with, uh, in terms of looking at, at Latino communities more broadly and, and how they are incorporating in the state of Missouri. Um, but you look and um, quite a few uh, folks are, uh, are foreign born, um, but uh, the, the, the raw numbers of Latinos in the United States has really, really grown, in, um, particularly in the last 25 years or so. And we're seeing some of that in, 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 the, in the farming community as well. Um, and then um, we're also thinking in terms of the Latino entrepreneurship. Um, Latinos tend to um, uh, uh, be quite entrepreneurial in a number of different ways. And, um, and we, we look at this in terms of uh, fueling business growth. 30% of business owners in the Midwest are Latino. Um, you know, we see a, a, a large number of Latino business owners now across the country, um, and they're, um, they have very different approaches to how they're integrating into their, their, their businesses and turn to communities. Um, and so some of that acculturation uh, can speak to us a little bit about how they're, um, how they're approaching their um, integration into <laughs> the field of farming. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's some of the things we were learning as we were putting our proposal together, but also as we were talking to people is uh, um, some of the things they're interested in is they, they get into it because it's really something they want to do. Um, and we heard that from a, quite a few of the farmers. Uh, they start out typically trying to grow their assets, um, things like accumulating land, um, uh, it might be uh, in, like in Southwest Missouri, there are a lot of them that are in livestock and it's like, how many animals do I accumulate before I start to sell them? And some of those kinds of things. Um, they are entering farming at a time when there really aren't a lot of people entering farming. Um, in, in, the, in our part of the country, they're, they're entering mostly pretty small farming and accumulating a small, uh, pieces of land and, and kind of cobbling together uh, enough to, to do some farming on it, although they're probably not making much money on that. Um, and then we're finding quite a few differences culturally between uh, farming in terms of how uh, Latinos practice farming and how the industry works. Um, they rarely borrow money and, um, and they typically are taking advantage of the um, resources, particularly government programs that can support their um, operations. Uh, and they're not really engaged that much in, in, in things like cooperatives and others. So what we're finding is they're not really connecting much to each other and they're not connecting much to the resources and, and um, available to them that other farmers typically are taking advantage of. Um, there is, uh, uh, we see, um, you know, looking at, um, we haven't incorporated the, the new census in that. But the, the trends in terms of farming and farmland is there's less land in farming uh, historically. Um, and, and then we're seeing more, uh, an increase in the number of producers. And if you look, um, uh, at Iowa, Michigan, and Missouri, um, yeah, the, the, the total number of producers has really kind of gone up. Um, and then, uh, the, uh, the project itself. So our approach to this was, was to think in terms of how these farmers, what they look like on a continuum. Um, uh, do they, what is their capacity? Do they have low capacity for farming here or high capacity? Some of the immigrant farmers um, are, are um, you know, some, they, they might have 
farming from where they came from might be quite different than what it is in the places they've moved to, even though some of these places look similar to where they come from. Um, and so uh, what is their capacity in terms of being able to, 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 to do this production farming? And then um, the, the type of livelihoods are they, they're, how diversified are their livelihoods? And, and we're kind of looking at that in terms of, um, uh, in the upper left quadrant is this idea they, they, they don't have a lot of capacity for farming, but they have a quite diversified livelihood. Um, in the upper right, it's they have both a high capacity and, and uh, diversity. In the lower left is low capacity and low diversity of livelihood diversity. And um, uh, in the lower right is high farming and, 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 and non-diversified livelihoods. That was our, our initial framework in terms of thinking about how we wanted to, to take a look at, at who these farmers were. Um, and this is another way to look at it. Um, uh, and in terms of thinking about the kinds of farmers and in our data we're starting to see uh we started to see some of these patterns um in, in our data um so in terms of operationalizing a model how do we think about what this looks like and how it works uh, we, we use the uh, community capitals model and we looked at the social capital which is the networks of farming the human capital which is their their capacities or abilities um, to capitalize on their experiences and their education. Um, the extent which the financial capity is in terms of how do they raise capital to, to do the, to, to grow their operations. The natural capital is the extent to which they um, use their land and resources, um, their management practices, those kinds of things. Uh, their political capital is the, uh, um, how, 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 how engaged are they in their communities? Are they participating in, in, in organizations? And, um, uh, and, and, and then are they uh, participating in their local communities? Um, the built capital is the value of their physical assets. And then the cultural capital is the extent to which they're operating, their ability to operate in the, in the, in the dominant culture, in this case, thinking in terms of how do they operate as farmers in, in, in our, um, in our, in the, the farming culture. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we saw, the, some of the descriptive steps and what we saw in some survey work that we've been doing. Um, Ruben is going to follow up and talk a little bit about some of the qualitative stuff in terms of the, uh, uh, some of the focus groups we did both with uh, resource providers and with farmers. And then Jan is going to talk a little bit about um, what we did in Iowa, in terms of uh, they were working mostly with um, farm workers that, that might be thinking about going into farming. And Ruben and I were both looking at farmers. Um, in Missouri, most of our farmers are, are fairly new entries to farmers within the last 10 years and they're mostly small. Um, there's a few larger farmers, but mostly they're small producers. And in Michigan, they they were a little more established and, and some of the producers a little bit larger so we could get a broader picture of that. Um, in this presentation, I'll just be going through kind of what we, we saw in, in Missouri. Um, the next uh, work, um, webinar we're going to do is really kind of looking across the states uh, and what some of the patterns are in the data in terms of what it means in, um, uh, in terms of understanding how uh, the, the, some of the um, motivations for the farming, some of the um, uh, how some of the networks are working and then based in our data. What we're doing do today is just kind of present a snapshot, more of a picture of, of what we learned. And so in this particular side, uh, you can see uh, that um, while most of our, our, our farmers are, um, are, are new, uh, a third, a little over a third, we're still uh, have been at it for, for 10 years or more. Um, and then most of the farmers were male. Uh, although there were nearly 13% female. Um, <clears throat> many of the farmers are um, in that, that uh, middle productive age between um, 35 and 54. Um, so we're not as old generally as, the, um, as, as, as most farmers are in, in, in Missouri. Our, our um, educational attainment is um, Roughly a little over half have a, uh, 
high school education or more. Um, uh, only 2% are part of, of a, a, a farmer's cooperative and only about 7% are part of a farming organization. So they're not really connecting to some of those resource and advocacy groups that, that other farmers typically belong to. Um, and um, some of them, but not many, are connecting to each other in terms of, uh, of getting the support and um, uh, that they need in terms of sharing what the, what they're learning about their, their practice. Um, uh, in terms of how they trust each, each other, uh, you, you look here, we had two questions. One was focused on the non-Latino farmer and one was focused on the Latino farmer. And we look at our, um, they, um, the, the numbers are actually quite similar. Um, they do trust uh, um, uh, uh, non-Latino farmers, some a little bit more, uh, and, um, uh, but it's very similar in terms of that. But quite a, there is some trust towards, towards, towards other farmers. Um, many own their own home, uh, they have a computer, uh, and, and they have a savings or checking account. And most of, about half had a, a household income of greater than $60,000. Uh, but most of that was not in farming. Um, financial capital, in terms of their agriculture sales, and chicken was the, the largest, although we had to, that's kind of skewed a little bit because we had uh, one, one chicken producer that produced a lot of chicken. So um, uh, it, it tended to, to, to squeeze out quite a few of the others. But you can see that there's quite a diversity of the things that, that some, uh, these, these farmers were we're producing and selling, and this was in 2017 sales. Um, and then the earnings um, from farming is, you know, is uh, a quarter of them earn more than 22,000 in agriculture products sold in, in 2017. Uh, but most of them uh, were earning small amounts of money from that, and which kind of tells us that they were mostly, many of these farmers are still mostly in an asset uh, accumulation kind of mode in terms of uh, the development of their farming practices. Um, uh, we, we had a series of questions in terms of who they um, would go to in certain situations and if they're going to buy land. Um, uh, we were seeing that quite a few um, are more likely to, to, to do that through, through family and friends. Um, so you don't see as much of, of the amusing things like real estate brokers and those kinds of things that um, uh, many others might. Um, in terms of their political capital, they, they just don't go to many meetings. Um, uh, they're not that involved in political organizations. So they're, typically their voice isn't heard very much in, in, in terms of, of uh, local decision making. Uh, and so we had a series of questions on acculturation based on um, uh, language use, language, um, um, uh, where they get their information and in terms of the, the media. And I forget the third one, but it's all about um, um, their, their, their connection to, to their language. So um, uh, about less than 2% were Anglo acculturated, meaning that. Um, that uh, um, that they, they operate well in in in, in English um, English only. Um, Forty eight percent are bicultural, um, which means they they operate well in English and in Spanish. And then uh, another forty eight percent are Latino culturated, meaning they operate primarily in in um, in Spanish. And we didn't find many that were marginalized, but by definition, that's a really difficult group to, to, to connect to in, in a research project. Um, community climate. This is kind of their perception of where they are. Um, this is a scale we developed uh, 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 in another project a few years ago. And there's three pieces to it. One is perceived experiences with discrimination, express, perceived language ability pressures, and then perceived negative community climate issues. Um, and so um, this was on a, um, um, so the scale was, was, was um, they, they didn't really um, 
in, in terms of uh, perceived experience with discrimination at 2.2 um, was kind of moderate. Um, language ability pressures were a little higher. And then the climate um, per perception of the community climate was a little bit higher than that. Um, so in terms of thinking about some of the descriptive statics and, and, and what we've been seeing in Missouri, we have about 1,400 farmers here, uh, roughly um, about 2% of our farmers. Um, so it's not a real important group in terms of, of, of their output and the production, but it is also it's an important group in that it's growing really quickly. Um, and it, it's one of our, uh, it's our fastest growing source, source of new farmers. Um, uh, the farms typically are very small, uh, but do tend to uh, mirror over small farmers overall, uh, thinking in terms of farming as a side enterprise. Uh, they aren't connected well to mainstream practice of farming or political, but they do tend to be more acculturated than the general Hispanic population. Um, and so, Part of our, our findings were kind of what we thought we would find in terms of them really needing to build more bridges um, within the practice of mainstream farming. Um, Ruben, are you ready to talk a little bit about um, some of the qualitative data? I am. Um, so if you will unshare your thing, I will see if I can share mine. Uh, I'm a disabled uh, screen sharing person. So oh, let me, let me do this. I, I need to give you permission to do that. Uh, let's see. Okay, now you should have it. Okay, uh, here we go. The uh, title of the proposal overall was Latino Agricultural Entrepreneurship Strategies, Networks of Support, and Sustainable Rural Development. So I'll be talking about the Michigan component. Um, I don't know if you can see that better if I do the full, the full slideshow. Uh, let me try the full slideshow and see how that works for you. <clears throat> so this is an interstate project. Uh, as uh, Stephen said, uh, the partners are Jen Flora, uh, myself and he. And what we wanted to do was the, to, to assess the assets and barriers uh, that these farmers experience in improving their livelihood options. Uh, the livelihood component really comes from, uh, uh, from Corinne, uh, who emphasizes that in, in, in her research. Uh, we also wanted to provide educational opportunities for extension personnel and the uh, other service providers who are out there to learn about the challenges and social capitals of Latino farmer entrepreneurial activities. And lastly, we want to develop a quick assessment tool for service providers to use when they begin to work with uh, Latino farmers, and uh, I've been talking with Chris Peterson on this. It's very, been very helpful in some of the ideas that he's provided. So the sites were Missouri, uh, Michigan, uh, and Iowa, as uh, Stephen mentioned, mainly small farmers in, in Missouri. Here in Michigan, we, uh, we have a mix of beginning and established farmers. The established ones are long time, and uh, it appears that in our sampling of the survey, we, we tended to, to have more, much more of the beginning uh, farmers mainly because of the kinds of connections that we have, although I do have a, a survey from about eight years ago that is much more reflective of the overall population of Latino farmers in Michigan. And then in Iowa, we have what we're calling the aspiring small farmers, uh, several from farm worker backgrounds, and Jan's going to be talking about that. Uh, so here again is that uh, model that Stephen talked about. The data uh, that I'm using uh, is based on uh, focus groups. We conducted uh, four uh, focus groups here in Michigan, two with providers and two with producers. Uh, we also conducted 10 individual producer interviews. Those were pretty substantial. Uh, and then we ended up with 70 respondents in our survey. So here's a demographic overview of, uh, of the ones that uh, participated in our project. Uh, seven uh, were women. That's about 10%, not much different from Missouri. Uh, the modal uh, age, if you will, is uh, 55 to 64. We're just slightly under uh, the, uh, media, uh, the mean age of white farmers, uh, not only in, in Michigan, but across the country. But we do have some, in, as you can see, who are uh, less than 35 years and those who are between 35, 44, and so forth. And just about 115% uh, about who are uh, over 65 years of age. The marital status, 
uh, we have it where 58 of the 70 were uh, married, four were partnered, four were widowed, and one was single. And then there were a couple who were married but living in different countries, I presume uh, the spouse is in the uh, country of origin and that person is here. Uh, where did they come from? Uh, we have a couple from, from Cuba, most of them were from Mexico and two were here from the United States. Uh, in terms of the, the immigrants, uh, immigration status, 23 were naturalized U.S. citizens, 33 were permanent legal residents, uh, one had another immigration status, uh, and 13 did not tell us uh, what their status was. So you can imagine what, that, what the implications of that is. Uh, in terms of uh, Michigan residents, one of them uh, was, had been living here from one to three, to three years, uh, four had been here from four to seven years, 63 were more than eight years, and two, probably those two who were born here in the United States, were here all of their life. <clears throat> in terms of uh, whether they were full-time or part-time farmers, about a third of them were full-time farmers. Uh, Two-thirds then were uh, uh, part-time. Uh, regarding the number of years, uh, 15 of them were from two to five years, so they're really beginning farmers, uh, 21 or one third, nearly one third were from six to 10 years, and the other third had been farming for more than 10 years. Uh, and that, by that we mean here in Michigan. Uh, in terms of the size of their farms, uh, 12 had uh, farms of less than five acres, 21 had five to nine acres, 21 had 10 to 19 acres, and 11 from 20 to 49 acres, and five uh, greater than 50 acres. So. You can see the pattern, I think, repeats itself relative to, to Missouri in that we do have relatively small farms uh, when you consider uh, what's going on. But also keep in mind that most of these, I think, were in fruits and vegetables. So they're here in Michigan, there's a substantial number who are, they're like, uh, if we have a thousand uh, producers, we probably have a third of them in blueberries uh, and asparagus and some other uh, fruits and vegetables. We're not, uh, you know, there's some large apple growers up north, uh, but mainly they're into fruits and vegetables. With the type of farm ownership that they had, 57 were single fi family owners or sole owners of the farm. Uh, 10 were in some sort of family partnership. Uh, one was an operator, meaning that they were running the farm for somebody else uh, who is not, uh, who's the owner, but not running the farm. And two were in some other sort of relationship uh, not clear what that is. Uh, and we asked them if this if farming was their primary activity. Uh, 19 said yes, and uh, 51 said no. So what we have here is what we call a mixed uh, uh, income process, uh, where you know they're earning something from the farm, uh, but they're also having uh, livelihood uh, strategies that bring in income from other sources. 58% uh, said that, or rather, 58 said that they had uh, previous farming experience. And 12, 12 of them, sorry, that's my phone. Uh, 12 of them said that uh, they did not, uh, let me turn this thing off, uh, that they did not have any farming experience. So uh, they kind of just threw themselves into the, into the mix here. Uh, we did, there was a considerable interest a few years ago about the number of Latino who were producing blueberries. And one of the things that came out of that, you know, when I came here to Michigan 13 years ago, I heard about that and I just assumed that what was going on is that the white farmers were aging out of the blueberry industry and the Latinos were moving in. Uh, actually, it turned out to be a little bit different from that. There's some of that going on, but what they were succeeding uh, was the black farmer. Black farmers in the uh, blueberry industry were, were aging out. Their children did not want to take it over. And so Latino farmers were moving in. Mainly these were, some of these, let me say, were coming in from Chicago who through a staging process had ended up in Chicago and then really were not interested in having their kids grow up there in, in the big city and all of the issues that turned up in the big city. So they came around the point of the lake and started uh, buying some of these uh, farms that uh, were for sale, moving their families there, and still maintaining very strong ties to what's going on in Chicago. Some of them even going back and working there and then coming and having, work, helping the family uh, with the farm. Uh, we asked them about government assistance in the last 10 years. 
uh, 14% or uh, 10 of them said that they had, and most of them said that they had not. So we talked a little bit about acculturation. Here's what it looks like here in Michigan, uh, English proficiency and use. We're really talking about uh, language, right? So 7% uh, said they almost never function in English. That's uh, you know the same kind of rate that we found in Missouri. 41% uh, are you know kind of mixed. They're able to communicate, but they're not highly proficient. And then you have those who are uh, able to function and those who almost always function in English. So about one one fifth of them. So uh, you can see that the highest the percent is over here where they are, have some proficiency in English, but not uh, completely. And I'm sure that they have some uh, concerns about how effective they are themselves. So in terms of the focus group results, here's what we have for the producers. Uh, reasons for becoming a producer, you know, we wanted to tap the values, the uh, views of their uh, um, becoming a producer. So some of them wanted to maintain generational continuity. So they had that uh, background in, in agriculture. Uh, they appreciate it as a way of living. Uh, they also find value in that it is a family activity. They, they can have the uh, family working on the farm uh, as an activity. Uh, the, the fallback position for them was, uh, uh, you know, becoming a farmer because they have, they understand they have limited human capital. They have limited education, proficiency in English, uh, those kinds of things. They also appreciate farming. Uh, they do, uh, you know, link up with that uh, lifestyle. Uh, and some of them said that they just wanted to work for themselves. Self-management was important for them. Uh, what was the economic importance of farming for them? Well, they thought that it was a very good uh, practice in terms of the development of a work ethic. And I think here they're bringing in the family. Uh, it's important in terms of livelihood, in terms of financial security, and a source of employment. It's also important in terms of developing uh, agricultural skills or what we would think of as human capital. The goals, the goals were kind of difficult to get them to, to speak very clearly about, but we were able to tease out a few of them. Uh, they want to build human capital. They want continuity in agricultural production on their farms. They want to develop more agricultural expertise, and they want to develop in terms of market orientation, or we can say market integration. What are some of the barriers that they saw? They were concerned about market prices. You know, the blueberries in particular uh, are not doing very well. They also tended to buy farms that were the, uh, the plants were of old uh, vintage and old types, and they haven't been able to really move to replace them with new varieties uh, that are more resistant to pests and are more uh, in demand than the market. Uh, they're very concerned about price uncertainty. Uh, they have a concern about the shortage of working capital, also a shortage of workers. Uh, they have concerns about the low return on investment. They're having difficulties controlling pests, and they are concerned about high production costs. Um, in terms of areas of planning, uh, they're really engaged in what we would call ad hoc production planning. That is, there's not very long-term planning going on here. They're sort of just adapting to the environment and to the demands of the environment as they go along. Uh, in terms of uh, even buying more land, what they do is they kind of sit back and wait for the opportunity. If the opportunity presents themselves, then they're willing to step forward and try to, to buy some pieces of land that are available. Uh, they take advantage of in, in emergent opportunities, basically, uh, and they uh, consider long-term investments, uh, but uh, there's kind of a, a gap there in terms of the, the planning part. There is the difficulties that they spoke to was record keeping, and I think this is pretty well known. Uh, the payment methods are difficult. Securing markets is difficult. Uh, they have farm worker issues, but that we're talking about the labor aspects of uh, hiring. Uh, and, you know, they have difficulties in accessing government support. They did want government support, but they simply aren't positioned uh, in terms of record keeping and language and so on to be able to access that. Uh, they want to access production knowledge uh, and they uh, want to be able to more effectively address issues of pest control. In terms of what uh, service providers I uh, have to say about Latino producers, you know, they work with them. Uh, 
in terms of you know relating with Latino farmers, they recognize that they have to build trust. One of the things about the Latino culture is that it is a personal oriented culture or person oriented culture. That is that you got to get to know the person before and develop a relationship with them before you can you know, get down to business, so to speak. So just as an example, let me tell you about the, you know, what happened to uh, American uh, uh, business people when they first started developing relationships with uh, businesses in Japan. You know, they show up, they are welcome, they, they uh, are invited to a dinner, there's a group dinner going on, there's some you know, uh, preliminary comments made here and there, and then the Americans wanted to get down to business, to start talking business, and we're told, no, 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 here tonight we're going to get to know each other, uh, we're going to enjoy a good dinner, and tomorrow we're going to get down to business. So there's a big difference between traditional cultures, which are person-based, and what I call Western culture, which is task-oriented. And so Western culture representatives are always very interested in uh, you know, getting down to business, and so they have to learn to be able to develop this relationship with persons uh, before moving on. Uh, it also requires a time investment if you want to build relationships. Uh, they recognize that there are some cultural differences and spoke about maybe some frustrations there. They recognize there are language barriers. And even if you're able to you know, have some uh, superficial conversation in English, uh, you never really know what the interpretation or the comprehension is that's going on on the other side in terms of who's decoding uh, what you're saying. Uh, they recognize uh, Latino farmers are very willing to adapt to changes and they use other Latinos and community partners as brokers to work with the Latino farmers because they don't always have those ties to those farmers directly. Some of the challenges for the service providers uh, is, uh, you know, they have to shift over to see outreach, outreach as a relational process as part of that, you know, getting to know the person. Uh, they have to address the uh, frustrations that they have with the language barriers. Uh, they lack Spanish language materials. Uh, they're concerned that they don't really understand Latino culture. Uh, and they are concerned about having the capacity to actually provide services uh, and about having to you know, sustain communications. What do they perceive challenges on the part of, of Latino farmers? planning. Uh, they don't see them doing the same sort of planning uh, that they're accustomed to in the Anglo-American culture. Uh, they uh, recognize that they do not understand government programs very well. Uh, and uh, let me see here, I'm getting this thing blocked by the, uh, by the part on the right side where I see all of you, but I can't see my slide. Uh, so understanding food safety is a concern. Uh, they need to uh, you know, get a handle on that. Uh, they have challenges in terms of accessing financial capital. Uh, they have credit history pro uh, problems, whether it's, you know, not having sustained relations with banks or other financial entities. Uh, they recognize that they continue to have language barriers. They need to develop the effective record keeping. And uh, it was also said that they needed to address uh, habitat management issues. Um, let me get back to my full slide. Uh, so just a few things, the community capitals framework. I want I won't say a whole lot about this because uh, Jan Flora, who is one of the co-PIs, the one for, for uh, Iowa, is one of the gurus in this field, but you know, he's the one that helped us uh, uh, apply this model. So as uh, Stephen said, it's built capital, financial capital, natural capital, uh, political capital, cultural capital, social capital and human capital. Uh, so uh, I don't know if John's gonna speak more about that, but you know, I just wanted to give him a shout out on that one. In terms of social capital, uh, you know, are these, the, the folks here in Michigan, are they uh, members of farming organizations? The no, which is orange, you can see 93% of them are not members. Uh, in terms of bridging capital, that is uh, developing con connections with people outside their own group to in, in the agricultural arena, you can see that most of them uh, have, you know, somewhat limited uh, connections to organizations outside of them. So basically, they're divided into fifths, uh, ranging from those who are high and those who are low and have everything in between. 
uh, in terms of social capital, whether they're members of informal groups of friends that meet to discuss farming, even among themselves, there's not a whole lot of uh, integration with uh, other, other Latino farmers. Uh, bridging social capital, uh, oh, we've already seen that one, and in uh, government and university programs, are they engaged, are they involved? 80% 80, 80 they are not. So you've got you know, a small percentage over here, uh, slightly growing uh, as, as you move to the left, which is the low end. So most of these are working independently. Uh, and I used to say that Latinos are the most disconnected population in this country, despite being the second largest population group, the most disconnected from our core institutions. I no longer say disconnected because it implies that they were once connected. I just say that they are unconnected. They're simply not connected to these entities. And uh, there are some reasons for that. Uh, in terms of bonding, social capital, sources of information among other farmers, uh, there's, uh, they tend to get it maybe from family members or from, uh, from other Latino farmers that they might know. But uh, uh, generally, their, their, their connections are very limited in scope. So what can we say about them? These are hardworking but struggling farmers. They have limited integration into the agricultural industry. They're independent from sector organizations, which means that the more integration needs to go on. There are gaps that we spoke about in terms of the service delivery systems. And there's a lack of capability on both sides. I think the cultural differences uh, show up in terms of Latino farmers themselves have to develop some skill sets and some uh, uh, human capital, but also the organizations on the other side need to be able to develop the capacity and capability to work, work with them. Uh, and there are also some structural differences. One of the things that was on one of the slides that I didn't mention uh, was that uh, uh, in terms of support uh, and the or organizational capacity of the service providers, uh, they tended to, to highlight the idea that small farms are not really of much interest uh, for service providers, that it's mainly, uh, their interest is mainly toward the large farm organizations and so forth. So that in itself, you know, is a structural problem that uh, uh, basically contributes to the uh, Latino farmer being separated from or not connected to some of the service organizations that are in the agricultural industry. So with that, I will turn it over to Jan and then uh, I assume that after that we'll have a brief uh, question and answer session. Okay, are, are we, uh, can you see the slideshow? Yes, we're able to see it, Jen. Is it full screen? On, on my screen, it doesn't show up as, as being full, full screen. Full screen, Jen. It is full screen. Okay, good. All right. Well, uh, Thanks everybody for, for listening in. And, and uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, about farm workers and particularly look at uh, the potential that they have to become farmers. And uh, <clears throat> all right, um, we, uh, chose Sioux County because it's a unique county in Iowa. It has a, uh, it is the first county in hog, dairy, egg, fed cattle, and sheep production. So um, as you can see, uh, the 
Dutch farmers who settled the area in the late 19th century have chosen to increase the intensity of their operations by engaging in livestock production. And that has uh, then resulted in the need for labor, which previously was provided by, by their families. And uh, beginning uh, after the turn of the 21st century, uh, Latinos were being hired, immigrants by and large, were being hired to take uh, those kinds of jobs. Um, so Sioux County is located almost in the northwest corner of Iowa and uh, borders on South Dakota, on the Missouri River and South Dakota um, and then is almost uh, touching is just one county from uh, Minnesota. And they now have about uh, close to 11% of their population is Latino. <laughs> the uh, Latinos are predominantly immigrants and uh, unlike uh, past uh, stair-step immigration, they come directly from their home countries to Iowa, uh, uh, the majority do, as you can see in, in the uh, uh, pie chart. Um, they also have a good deal of stability in, in their work. Uh, the median length of, of employment on the farm that they are currently employed on is three years, which is uh, quite remarkable, I think. Uh, moving into uh, human capital, and again, looking at the question of language, uh, basically uh, two-thirds of them understand English well or okay, that is regular, um, so they can get along in, um, in terms of receiving information from their uh, employers and supervisors, uh, but uh, only about half speak and read English, uh, about half speak and re read English poorly. So um, the communication is not necessarily two way. And uh, in general, the, the employers and supervisors often do not speak uh, Spanish. And uh, reading uh, capacity is even lower. <coughs> Okay, um, <clears throat> so we asked them ab about the training that they'd received in livestock care and uh, also on the human side of livestock raising. And uh, there was a good deal of interest in gaining more capacity to uh, do their jobs well. Uh, we asked whether their training was in English or Spanish, whether they would like more training in specific areas, or if they were interested in, in if they were not interested in more training in those areas. And uh, what we found is, was that most training does occur in Spanish. Uh, we don't know whether it's done by native Spanish speakers or not. Uh, it appears that there are instances in which training is conducted in English, um, but um, w from the language capacity, we know that some are not fully understanding uh, that training. The greatest demands uh, are for animal welfare training, animal nutrition, and, and animal feeding in that order. And apparently the greatest deficit is in Spanish-speaking trainers is in uh, animal welfare. 
uh, in, uh, and Spanish language uh, training in other areas is uh, more prevalent than in English, so that's good. <coughs> financial literacy and uh, human uh, relations uh, show the greatest demand on the human side of livestock raising for, for training. Worker safety and human relations are the most frequent subjects of training. Um, we ask about uh, sexual abuse training, going down to the third bullet here, and few people, uh, men or women, have, have received sexual abuse training. And among the women workers, um, there appeared to be some interest in sexual abuse training, but uh, looking at the pie chart, only a third of the workers felt that their employers had clear procedures for dealing with sexual harassment. So that's clearly, a, a, to some degree, an unfelt need um, and one that is uh, really has not received very much attention. And in terms of human capital, we see that uh, families um, have substantial numbers of members, so the, the future human capital uh, if, if uh, the offspring stay in, in the community is, is secure. Um, the amount of uh, time that people work and our uh, opportunity sample was uh, biased toward, um, toward uh, dairy uh, workers. And uh, you'll see that the vast majority of, of workers work 10 to 12 hours a day, a, a shift, a regular shift in the dairy uh, work is a 12 hour shift. And uh, then if you look at the last uh, pie chart, you'll see that um, a very high proportion of people work uh, between uh, more than five days a week and uh, seven, in general, in the dairy industry, uh, they have one day off every two weeks, so they work six and a half to seven days a week. <clears throat> and social capital, the, the results that we found are compatible with what uh, was found in Michigan and, and Missouri with respect to Latino farmers. Um, there is somewhat more bonding social capital in terms of getting together with friends to talk, eat, or drink uh, than there is uh, belonging to uh, various formal organizations. And generally, uh, so you have about a, a almost 40% that are not involved in any groups and then uh, if you add to that, the, those who are only involved in one, and that one organization is frequently their church, then uh, it leaves uh, for the other two categories a, a rather small share of them uh, having uh, involved in other community organizations. <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, another, another way of looking at social capital is to look, and th this is bridging social capital, first the relationship with the employer. And uh, one of the things that uh, an Argentine uh, researcher who also worked on this project found in, uh, in central Iowa was that uh, green, uh, corn and soybean farmers uh, tended to treat their hired men quite well by providing them with things like a truck or sometimes housing and sometimes uh, uh, a, a little bit of land 
in, in order to uh, keep them employed, but you don't see that sort of thing with uh, the uh, farm workers who are working in the livestock areas. <clears throat> so very rarely did they, uh, the uh, employer uh, provide uh, animals or a site for, for the animals to uh, eat and graze. Um, and they, they were more frequently provided them with in-kind uh, produce. And, uh, and then a rather striking feature is that uh, uh, two thirds of them do not have bank accounts. So that suggests a lack of uh, trust in the, in the formal uh, organizational system. In terms of political capital, we find the same thing as was found with the farmers, that um, in terms of being involved in, in organizations that discuss or make decisions about local issues, uh, they were uh, quite unlikely to be involved. And it's not surprising given the, the numbers of hours that people work, that they simply wouldn't have time for that. But they're also uh, various cultural and organizational barriers to that as well. In terms of uh, built capital, uh, rather than talking about land, we'll talk about housing for farm workers. And uh, half of them live in houses, uh, and then an, another quarter in apartments, and, in, and the last quarter in trailers. And uh, um, of those uh, that the small share uh, who actually own their own homes, uh, they're more likely to be uh, uh, owners. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, they're, they're more likely to have their house paid off than, uh, than uh, to still have a mortgage. So uh, folks are, are pretty uh, conservative in in terms of their economic uh, activities. In terms of cultural capital, one of the things that uh, uh, the, the vast majority are either from Mexico or Central America. And uh, those cultural differences uh, form barriers uh, to interaction between Anglo and, and uh, Latino uh, immigrants. Uh, and, but um, there are signs that in Sioux County there those differences are, are beginning to be seen as, as uh, ways of making linkages and for the past two or three years there has been a uh, Latino festival, summer festival in, in Orange City which uh, brings uh, lots of Latinos and Anglos together. Uh, another aspect of cultural capital is a strong emphasis on family. And, and that resonates very well with the, the uh, Anglo population uh, to, be, uh, to a large degree because of those common roots that they have uh, uh, going back uh, more than, well more than a century uh, from their uh, having the common Dutch origin. Uh, so it allows um, uh, at least the potential for, for greater ties between uh, the two groups because of their families. With respect to financial capital, if we look at the kinds of wages that the farm workers get, um, they're, they're, those are not minimum wage jobs, but they're also not living wage jobs either. Um, so the average hourly wage is somewhere in the realm of between 13 and 14 dollars, which because people work so many hours, translates into earnings uh, from farm work. Uh, in the mid uh, $30,000 per year. 
level. <clears throat> um, so the last question that I want to address then is there a pathway uh, from a farm worker to farmer? And uh, um, we see that a substantial majority uh, have an interest in operating a farm. Most of them come from rural areas. They have a strong um, relationships with their with livestock. Uh, they they do a good job of caring uh, for livestock. Um, <clears throat> and uh, surprisingly, we found that uh, uh, a significant minority actually had access to farmland, even though the cost of farmland in Sioux County is higher than in any other uh, county in Iowa in most years. Um, but, and the, the access, some of the access to farmland, however, is, is in their home country, which uh, could have an impact on uh, their ability to acquire capital, which would then allow them to buy farmland in Iowa. And uh, again, similar to what we found with the farmers uh, in the other two states, uh, they have rather small acreage. Um, so uh, another question is, uh, are people able to get loans uh, uh, which they might use for, say, purchase of land or equipment to get involved in farming? What I thought was particularly interesting is that the more formal uh, sources of loans, uh, the, your employer and a bank, even though most of them are not banked, uh, is more important than uh, various kinds of informal types of credit, including uh, credit from relatives or payday lenders. So again, we see that conservative orientation financially that is so important. But in the end, um, about half of the farmers who were interested in owning, uh, in, in becoming farmers, uh, indicated that they expected to operate their own farm in five, year, five years from now, uh, which I think may be a little bit overly optimistic, but, it, but it's interesting that uh, there really is that strong interest. And a, uh, there, there are some openings uh, for them to, uh, to actually act on, uh, on that uh, desire. Um, I think the, the real barrier is the lack of support from employers uh, in, in uh, helping them get involved in, uh, directly in farming. And one has to question somewhat the kind of training and learning that they have on, on these industrial livestock farms and the applicability that that will then have to, uh, to their, uh, if they were to become farmers. And then the last point that I uh, wanted to mention very briefly is that there are a lot of external factors that impinge on, on these farm workers that prevent them from moving, say, into farming or uh, scaling the economic ladder. And uh, perhaps one of the most important is that farm workers and domestic workers were left out of the National Labor Relations Act of 1938, uh, which had a, a significant racial overtones. And uh, it's still, it's still an issue. So that means that if you work 12 hours a day, uh, you do not get overtime pay, and uh, and there's no, there are no limits to the amount of time that you work, and uh, no uh, safety inspections, etc. So uh, then uh, there's also a little time for family and community life because people do work so long, so much, and then many families uh, contain undocumented individuals uh, 
we surmise that at least 40% of the farm workers we interviewed were probably undocumented. I, I suspect it's higher. And, uh, and in the focus groups, men and women agreed that, that uh, being undocumented was uh, probably their top uh, problem that they had. And, and then lastly, housing and transportation issues are intertwined. Housing is quite expensive in, in the two largest towns in, in uh, Sioux County, uh, Orange City and, and Sioux Center. So um, if you, but if you have to live outside of those towns, uh, then you have the issue of transportation to work, which if you happen to be undocumented, uh, puts you at risk of being arrested. So uh, there are clearly some important structural problems that farm workers experience. So I'll uh, uh, stop at that point and uh, I guess we have a little bit of time for questions. Anyway. I'm sorry, we can't hear you very well. Well, I'd say all three of those pretty much mirror my experience working with Hispanics for 27 years, that they tend to clump in groups. They don't tend to come to meetings unless they're done especially for them. And um, they don't have an awful lot of financials and really don't want to share any financials. Mark, did you uh, come up with solutions to all of those problems? Gosh, I wish I had a solution. I don't know how many times I've given them talks about you need a balance sheet to go talk to the bank and get some money, <laughs> and this is how you build one, or you need to keep records, and um, they pay real close attention. They're real excited about farming, but all the other stuff that goes with it just doesn't really catch their... Um, <coughs> interest. You know, you'll talk about keeping financial records and they go, well, can we pay somebody to do that? And I'm going like, well, yeah, but then that other person knows more about your business than you do. You should have your wife do it. And that's the last person in the world they want to do their books. Um, even though that's pretty common on most Anglo farms. Yeah. Have you ever tried to do like direct one-on-one -on -one assistance with helping them get set up to do it? That seems to be a gap. Like they get it. But then if there isn't consistent follow-up after, that's where I see the disconnect. Have you had that experience? Uh, I would, no, I have very seldom done one-on-ones. I have done one-on-one -on -one balance sheets with people, um, but uh, I'm really excited that Florencia is here now and that she can, she can do one-on-ones because actually it took me 10 years to learn how to understand the, you know, the, the, uh, the finances and the bookkeeping because I didn't want to know anything about it when I was in school. It wasn't until I got this job and growers were saying, I can't afford to do that, that I started paying attention to the business. And Ruben is right that the, the, the uh, blueberry industry looked really good 20, 15 years ago. And for the last 10 years, it's just collapsed and they're just trying to figure out how they can keep from losing lots of money farming blueberries. In Michigan, I can do one-on-ones with farmers. So if you have anyone and you want to send them my way, um, I'd be happy to help. That's awesome. We're really excited to have you, Florencia. One of the things that we're doing here in Michigan too is that we've designed a two course sequence farm management that's bilingual, bicultural, uh, targeting uh, Latino farmers. And Marcelo, you wanna speak uh, just a minute or two about the motivation? Because one of the things that you've been emphasizing is the financial aspects and the balance sheets. And uh, uh, tell us how they're picking that up. All right, if Marcelo's not there, then uh, uh, Filiberto, you're the co-teacher on that. You want to speak to that as well? Yeah, sorry. Um, 
I have been, uh, we have been uh, working on this uh, farm introduction to farm management course for the second year. And we are emphasizing uh, issues like uh, record keeping. Uh, we're telling them instead of having the, all their invoices in the back of their, in one of their back uh, pockets in their, they can have, they can buy, uh, buy a small uh, cardex, uh, the, the, a small fi file holder with many uh, files that they can start uh, dividing their uh, expenses. Another thing that we are emphasizing is developing the uh, income statement and balance sheet that will help them to to build a business plan. Um, we, we are emphasizing about budgets as a anecdote. Uh, we told them, ladies, because we have some of, uh, females in the course, why do you are you don't get in charge of the, uh, you develop a budget and control the expenses, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of weeks later, uh, one of the female students came to us and said, hey, Maestro, we, uh, I developed the budget as, as you told us, it worked very nice. The problem is that I assign $50 expenses to my husband for his personal expenses and he got really mad at me so how can we, I, I can proceed with that so, uh, <laughs> um, another thing we're trying to open oh, we're trying to emphasize about markets um, that there's farm market is only one possibility that there are many other possibilities to sell their products we're trying to connect them with the organization in Minnesota that is helping them to uh, market their products. Um, we are having some uh, classes about uh, food safety. Uh, in parents, all the classes are in Spanish. Uh, food safety. Uh, we we took uh, one of my classmates when I was doing the, my PhD, who is an expert in taxes. Uh, he he gave a presentation and there were a lot of questions and he says he, he told me after that that was uh, the best group that the best groups because he came the two for two years the best groups that he he was dealing with because they were highly interested in the taxes etc cetera, etc cetera. and finally we uh, yesterday we we cover uh, hiring farm workers and all the problems that the farmers are having with the COVID-19 now, um, both farmers and farm workers, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, how, how they're going to deal. They're, they don't have any support from uh, or other organizations to deal with these farm workers. And then we're going to cover two, two courses or two classes on food safety and the last uh, four classes will be on leadership and social capital. So we have a complete, uh, we cover a complete panorama that will help them uh, to, to deal with their farms. So, um, Dr. Martinez uh, conduct a focus group last year and some of the responses were, oh, we thought that we, we knew everything, but now we learned that we, we, need, we know only a little bit. So, and they were very happy about all the results, uh, uh, about all the uh, subjects that we're covering. And even more, there are a couple of students that uh, they decide to take the course again because they said, we learned a lot about this. Uh, Let's see how it goes. Now, as Mark says, there's a lot of problems with the blueberry uh, sector, and there's a lot of pressure. I haven't heard if someone already adopted, but there's a lot of pressure to uh, to crop hemp and marijuana. I don't know. Uh, we, we have, I haven't seen anything. Uh, Filiberto, did you see someone uh, already moving to that area? Uh, nah, not much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you see, there's a cognitive issue on the part of the, uh, of the of the farmers. That is, that they think that they already know enough, but they don't. And on the other side, uh, one of the things that came up that I didn't mention it is that there's a tendency on the part of service providers 
to think of Latino farmers as farm workers, but not as farmers. Uh, and that was one of the things that came out in, in the uh, focus groups as well. Yeah, another big point is that they always complain that uh, all the trainings and all the support are aimed to the big farmers and they receive very few support. The small farmers receive very few support. Hi. Hello. Yeah, we hear you. Oh, I, I would like to, gather, to give you one of my points of view about your feedback. And it is related to uh, we had very similar I think in three in the three states we have very similar circumstances and I have been working with Latino farmers in Missouri together with Steve and other people here and effectively um, financial issues are very big deal Ross is in the meeting here and he knows very much what the problem is when the Latino farmers come to the office trying to apply for for any financial support and the issue is like they don't understand the financial statement they don't understand understand the forms to apply for and many times they don't have any records any production records and that is a big big constraint here in Missouri that doesn't allow them to qualify for any kind of program there are many new programs that the USDA has been more flexible for minorities and underrepresented farmers to apply for. For example, the microloans that requires a lot of less requirements to be able to qualify for it. And still, we still have the issue of not qualifying. And Maybe Ross or maybe Jessica here can provide more feedback about some updates to facilitate that connection with Latino farmers and that may help us in other states. Um, but it is good that uh, we have the same, the, same, the same consistence about how they don't have the financial information and the financial literacy to apply for this kind of resources. And in the long time ago, when I was working with Steve and, and developing financial capacity about how Latino farmers were learning those topics, we find out in one way, like you teach them information one, in one session, the next session, they kind of don't follow up or they don't know, they forgot or they don't have the information and now information in their background of education, like they don't have very high degree of education. Most of these guys are six years of formal education or less. So they are not able to process all this information we provide them. So we need to find different ways to help them. And that is part of what the USDA need to do to facilitate that connection. And I say that because talking with farmers in one class, you say, hey, this is the balance sheet, this is your cash flow, that's, that's how you connect profits and losses. And then the next session, you try to provide a review and you start asking questions, hey, did you, how, how you understand this, this tool like cash flow? And they seem like, oh, I, nobody answered the stuff like that, you know? So there is a misunderstanding of how we can provide education to them, and we need to find the right way to do it. And the USDA is a very big support at this point, and I'm glad that they flexibilize, they make more flexible the access to, to resources like with microloans. But if we get some feedback how the, how the farmers have been applying to those programs and their experience, from Ross or from Jessica here in the meeting, that will be great. Yeah, I think there's a couple things we learned about training from uh, those projects uh, Eliazar and I worked on. One is that, uh, and we, it shows up in our data too, that a lot of the farming is done uh, uh, as a family unit. So some of the training probably needs to be more focused on the whole family as opposed to just on the farmer. Um, 
Another piece of it is um, they responded best to the stuff that we actually did on farm. And, and so, um, uh, and, you know, if we can link the things like the financial literacy training to, to their experiences on the farm, and they can see that linkage between if I can learn how to do this, this is a, a possibility for me in terms of, of growing my own uh, farming operation. I think we might have more success with that. But, um, well, it's one of the issues with that is the ray of return on investment they do. Mm -hmm. Most of these guys, like, well, um, we had different samples and we had different population maybe in our samples. Mm -hmm. But one of the issues is the income coming from farming. Mm -hmm. And most of these guys, they don't make more than $10,000 a year from farming. And most of these guys are livestock producers. Yeah. So they sell three or four livestock a year. Uh, and then they make up to maybe $7,000, $10,000, and that's it. Other people may a little bit more, but at the end, when they made their their, their the, the balance sheet, obviously they don't met with what they were expecting for. So one of the issues will be like, they don't feel the motivation to do it in a long stem because they don't see a high rate of return. And that is one of the issues we are also working on it. To, to help this small farm to sustain in a profitable way, but also in the social and environmental way. And that is kind of a big challenge at this time with all what is going on right now. Yeah, most of the farmers we, we interviewed didn't, weren't making any money at it. But when we look at their goals and uh, where they'd like to go with their farming, that tends to be uh, something they would like to, to, to see happen more. And the, the, the reality is, is if they're going to make more money on it, they're gonna have to learn how to, um, how to do the books and they're gonna have to think more um, aggressively about their relationships and, and, the, um, um, and, the, and the resources they access to help develop the farming operations. And so yeah. part of the, the training thing is really figuring out how do you connect their um, motivations to the to development of their capacity uh, to do those things. And then shall we talk about next steps? We've run out of time here. And sure. I uh, so, uh, we have two more webinars planned. Um, we have one tentatively set for the, I believe it's the 1st of May at 11 o'clock. And then the second one would be two weeks later, also at 11 o'clock central would be noon Eastern. Um, and the, the second one really is going to focus more on what we've really learned by looking at the relationships between the different capitals and what that means for their farming operations. So what is the impact of, of their social capital on other aspects of what is the, the relationship between um, uh, you know, their acculturation, their, uh, uh, the income they're generating and those kinds of things. And, and so uh, we've been doing some work with that and there's some really interesting things there that we want to explore with you a little bit. Um, and then the last session is really looking at those tools we've been developing out of this research, making what we're learning and, and the development of the, really that simple assessment tool that uh, folks can use to really figure out where farmers are. Um, they, um, really kind of in that we're not making any money, but we're trying to collect resources to to grow our operation, or maybe we're making a little bit of money, but we, we, you know, we really kind of wanted to move to a, a higher level, or maybe we're a, a more mature operation, and we're kind of sustaining what we, we want to do. And so we're, we're developing a tool to kind of help assess where those are and then think about the kinds of support they might need in order to go where they want to go from there. And that'll be that last day. Jan. This is Jan. Um, I think, um, we're planning on we're planning on Thursday. Yes, on uh, Thursdays. So that would be the thirtieth of April and the fourteenth of May. Okay. Thanks, Jan. So the fourteenth uh, of May and the thirtieth of April, uh, eleven Central Time and uh, noon uh, Eastern.
And then the presentation and the um, and the a recording of the session will be available. Um, I will put it up on our Cambio Center website, and I believe Ruben will be able to put them up on, on uh, the Julian Samoran Research Institute website as well, so folks can access those. So if you had folks that you know wanted to be here but weren't able to, and there were a few people I talked to that wanted to come that couldn't, um, uh, we'll, we'll be able to make those resources available. Um, and when we have the um, final agenda for the next session, um, if if you were con contacted directly by Jan, Ruben, or I, um, we'll be happy. To, we'll make sure that you get all of that information. If you were uh, referred by somebody else but didn't get that directly, let one of the three of us know. We'll make sure you get that information directly. Yeah, and if there are any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, please uh, go ahead and email us, and uh, we'll see how we can address them. Uh oh. I uh, keep crying. Happy, babe. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. I um, uh, appreciate you staying in here and um, uh, uh, um, and, and all the all the work you do in terms of working with these farmers. Um, hopefully, we'll get to visit with you again in two weeks. Okay, I look forward to it. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Bye.